Oklahoma Ag in the Classroom are partners with us at Oklahoma Agritourism. They're a phenomenal group to work with. And our Zoom monitor herself is right here, one of our great Ag in the Classroom coordinators, Miss Emily. So if you guys have any questions or want to reach out to her after we're finished with this session, I'm sure she'd love to give you some business cards, help you out, um, and maybe even work with you to get something ready for your farm. Um, now I'd like to introduce our guest speakers from Carolyn's Country Cousins Pumpkin Patch, um, all the way from Missouri, Carolyn and Buddy, and I will let them introduce themselves. Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Because it feels like I'm in a box up here. <laughs> um, don't be afraid. We don't bite either. I mean, there's a couple tables here and there's some up here if anybody wants to get a little closer or something like that. Um, I'll probably just hand this to you. Or whatever you want to, you want to use that? Okay. Um, he wants to be able to talk whenever he can. I understand that. So, uh, yeah, I'm Carolyn Rash from Liberty, Missouri. I'm right at the northeast edge of Kansas City. We're in the Missouri River bottoms. Um, as far as our farm, to give you an idea, uh, we farm full time as far as commodity crops, corn, soybeans, a little bit of wheat, things like that. That's what he does. And we have three sons and a son in law that all farm together. So, uh, we have a lot of family involved. It's been getting larger by the year. And uh, then we, it about, you know, years ago is when this venture started. So we, um, this did not come about overnight. Like the other people that were up here earlier and talking, a lot of trials, tribulations, things that have happened, mistakes. Um, some things go good, some things don't go so well. So again, and I'm really good with, if you guys have a question as we're talking and like me, I would forget it by the end. If you wanna just raise your hand, I can probably hear you or, or we can repeat the question because I'm not, don't have a problem being interrupted at all. Um, again, I'm pretty technologically challenged also. <laughs> I have a web guy. Uh, I do a little bit on social media. I have, my daughter helps me. She helped us do the, uh, the PowerPoint. And so it's kind of basic we can fill in a lot of the gaps and we'll kind of explain, I'm a visual person, I'm the touchy feely person that has to see something. So we have, I'll talk with my hands, um, we have uh, some things up here that we've uh, integrated and added to our business and that have worked and not worked. So that's why I wanted to show you a few examples as we kind of go along. Um, but to get you an idea, yeah, we're at the Northeast edge of Kansas City uh, we started out very, very, with my clicker, I'll figure this out. Um, maybe twice. There we go. Yes, traditional farmers. There's what it looks like part of the time. Uh, corn, soybeans, um, green bins. We are in the Missouri River bottoms. The trees that you see at the back is the, tr is the tree line in next to the river. Um, we are originally from about an hour east of Kansas City, way out in the country. Very small towns. He's from, I'm a little bit larger town than he was from. We only grew up 10 miles apart, but definitely way out in the sticks. We only ended up at the farm where I'm at and where the pumpkin patch is um, that his family purchased at the year before we got married. So that's why we ended up up that close to Kansas City. Works great for an agritourism. Sometimes we get tired of the traffic now, but um, you kind of have to deal with the good and the bad and the ugly. So anything yet? No? Okay. All right. So, <laughs> uh, yes. And this is how I kind of, um, this is how I got started. Uh, they opened a new farmer's market. I had two very small children at the time, two boys, too close together and they needed to go with dad every once in a while. So, um, and I had a big garden and the people up at the city didn't, I would tell them to come pick green beans and they go, oh, if you're in town, bring them by my house. Um, no, uh, I'm not doing that. So they opened a farmer's market and that's how I started doing it on Saturday morning, started going to a farmer's market, selling it off the tailgate of my little pickup and a you know, little, uh, little bitty table and stuff like that. He would keep the boys and he would not come close to the farmer's market. And through the years, we developed great relationships at the market. Then it was like we all had to go up when our boys got old enough to help and, and everybody helped. But I did the farmer's market from 87 or 86 to about uh, 87. Okay, we started in 87 
And then I opened the pumpkin patch in 91, but we kept going to the, to the farmer's market up until about 14, 13 or 14, somewhere in there. And since then, actually our oldest son and his stepdaughter were going to the farmer's market every year. I mean, we can grow sweet corn, we can grow corn, we can grow sweet corn. And there's a big demand for fresh sweet corn and all of the, a few of the other things, but our, one of our big things was sweet corn. Everybody wanted it to freeze it, grow, you know, have it. It's not like the stuff in the store. So that was our signature item was our sweet corn at the market. And so we kept going for years and years and years. And then I developed into, I was doing some fall festivals. Like we'd have a fall fest here, the cities would have, or towns would have and set up a big booth. And it was haul all the hay bales, straw bales there and all the pumpkins and all the decorations and all the stuff like that and be the whole weekend and then you have to haul it all back home what you didn't sell and then a friend of mine says well they just opened up the new highway in front of you why can't you open up a barn and i go because nobody's going to drive out here in the country to pick up stuff like that you know but um i had a barn and i didn't have much other area he was trying to bulldoze it all under to make more farm ground but um i did have one older barn and i cleaned it all out two stalls and had the concrete there. And um, that's what I started selling. I found a friend of mine that had, um, like she was doing ceramics, I think, or something like that. And then another guy that was doing honey on us. So he gave had the honey for me to sell. And then I had the little pumpkins. And um, I think it did have a fence right in front of the concrete that might've had, there's one picture here with all the, the weeds, the weeds, yes. The weeds out there with the one goat or sheep in front of it. So. Um, we had very, very little to start with. It was just selling a little bit out of this. Um, the picture on the upper left hand side was probably a couple of years in. That was a, we have, we, he actually owns a very small private airport and we have a lot of friends that, that have home built and they fly and they like to take pictures. So they took a picture of the, the first two buildings that we ever had. The white barn on the left was my market and this other was a dilapidated old farrowing house that we didn't use for the first couple of years. And then to give you an idea, the right hand side, it's kind of what we do now. That's still again, several years old. So um, probably five years old or six years old, more than that even. And to do that, but it's at least six years. yeah, it's at least six years old. But what we did was we were open in 91 and 92, like that picture up there. And then 93 was our big flood in Missouri across the Missouri River bottom. I mean, water up to here. I mean, the whole 10 miles wide from bluff to bluff was water. We had big floods that year and we had no pumpkin patch, no pumpkins, no whatever. And that was when we went to, um, we went to a farm in Kansas and we went to a farm in Iowa and visited them. And I was like, oh, I need food and I need animals. Those are my next two things. So sure enough, I found a gentleman that with a little, he, he, he might have, I think, served oh, at had we'll a snack back shack. To the flood here. What? <laughs> it was a wet year, so the what pumpkins we had didn't have much room. You're gonna have to get closer. So I talk loud. Well, they didn't have much room, so when we went back in boats to put stuff up high. These pumpkin patch plants would pop out of the ground and float by. <laughs> 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 Along with everything else. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it, after the flood and cleaning up all the mess, I totally gutted the, um, the farrowing house and we made a few animal pins and stacked straw bales, made our first very crude maze like you used to see, like for barn warming or something like that. And then we, um, I had a guy that like I said that, that had been doing food. He made a little snack shack over here and he cooked like hot dogs and had bottled pop. So that was the extent of food service at that point and the beginning of the animals because everybody wanted animals and wanted things to do. And then, um, yeah, like I said, just like this, you can see there's my weeds back there in the back with the sheep in the weeds. And this was the picture in the middle like that uh, the, the little girl sitting on the big pumpkin was our 31 year old daughter now that's a veterinarian and then our kid and then another girl that actually still works for me part time and that was the beginning of our store with the pumpkins and the honey and the broom corn and a little bit else and 
just pumpkins sitting out on the concrete. That's pretty much what we started with. Things like that. It was very, very crude. No wagon rides, no nothing at the point. Those weeds weren't really there. You, the, the, the beauty of photography, we had that behind. We stuck it where just make everybody feel at home. <laughs> You can see that one, that one flatbed wagon does have pumpkins stacked on front of it, but we didn't have much of anything at the, at the thing. And then there I was doing our first school tours, field trips, staying in front of the in front of the picnic table and they were sitting on the concrete out there in the middle of nowhere. And I was just explaining to them about gourds and pumpkins and how it grew. And we did that. And then we later on after the flood, we put a tent up because Either the sun was hot or it was cold or they're sitting on the concrete or whatever. We put that tent up twice. We had a big oh, snowstorm in October and it went to the ground. Yeah. yeah, the tents and snow don't get along very well. So uh, in a few picnic tables, and that's where we did school tours for quite a few years underneath there, uh, doing all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, it was, a, you can see that barn, that thing's in the snack shack back in the corner. The guy kind of fenced it in. I have a very, very um picky health department in our county i mean everything that we do now is all health department approved um i i don't get by with anything i don't want to i haven't come out it's just like all the other inspections you know we were having to do the animal inspections now we're not really having to but as far as health department um we do our safety inspections on the other activities we can tell you about we have um you know i the propane commission found me because I use propane in my ovens and in a couple of heaters and anywhere that you have propane that you have the public, you're supposed to be inspected yearly by the state commission. And so they come out and he's very nice about, I mean, I'm good with it. You tell me what I need to do, what I need to add, how I need to fix it. I'm good with it. Just, you know, I don't mind going by any of the rules. I just need to know what the rules are. That's what I tell everybody with. Just tell me what the rules are and I can make it work. Yeah, is, is all I want to know with any of it. So I'm, we're good with that. We're good with the health department. Um, yes, and so then we have like, uh, this is kind of a really big jump. I, I think I must've been busy a few years and don't have a whole lot of pictures for about five years. They're kind of in between, but you can see we went to more fencing. I have pumpkins with sign and there's a building back there that didn't come to, I know, oh, two, but, and then our, our um, flyers here in the middle and some of our other things, my very first, actually even that first year and Last year was the first year I did not have these printed after 31 years, but we, this was my first marketing was taking these. We had, I had one other young friend that had sold at the farmer's market with me. I had her come sit with me at the pumpkin patch during the day when one or two cars would drive in and I would have her sit there and I'd go up to the local Walmart and put these under win, under windshield wipers of minivans with car seats. That was my first marketing piece. And until last year, this orange flyer would show up every single year. I, it, and so much what I really got using it to later, because we got really big in school tours for a lot of years uh, until things just have changed. And this would go home in the bag that you see up there with their pie pumpkin and their honey stick and their coloring book to go home with. So this flyer has been my signature Astro Bright Orange was my signature item, had just basically the information. Um, you know, it's been in the last probably two or three years that things have, have changed. And I and last year was the first year I really didn't even print that. But Tell them about the bag. The bag, we'll get, yeah. Okay, so the bag. Uh, that all goes, ties in with the school tours. When we were getting very popular with school tours, and again, I, they say it's a compliment to have other people mimic what you do. And a lot of people, we were the first ones in Kansas City that really, had anything like this. There was one other farm that did a few things out in the but as far as adding an activity, doing different things, adding food service and everything, we were pretty much the first ones. And so I had the opportunity to explore the market probably a lot more than I did. And uh, I mean, that I would have now, there's a lot more competition. You know, you just have to up your game. That's all there is to it. So we had the flyers and then I actually, um, at the time, I had a person employed that was a pretty good artist, and she was very creative. And we developed this uh, as kind of one of our mm, marketing tools, yet it was needed at the time. 
was we printed this, or we went to a couple of grocery stores. I had one with one first, then they turned me down and I had to go to the other chain with Hy-Vee stores or a big grocery store in Kansas City coming down from Iowa. And I went to them and they would print this for me, this coloring book. And this was of pictures of like our farm. It had pictures of my one red barn. It had pictures of my donkey, pictures of my cow, the grain bin, everything that was there. And it, so it was entirely our property, but they would print this for me and then give them back to me. And I would be able to use them and give them to school tours. And the bag, when plastic bags were still okay, uh, they would print the bags. That's our railroad that we added in 02. They would print the bags on there and give them to me to use. So we, um, this was a big signature item. Like I said, uh, things have changed a lot. Our school tours have changed in the last probably six years where if you're requiring uh, younger children to have seat belts, the school budgets were cut tremendously. The individual kids were having to pay for their busing like $3 a person. I mean, it just cut into the business a lot. We just, we've had to really down, I had to up my, uh, employees during the for that short amount of time a day you know oh, i need like six more tour guides from 10 to 3 or something like that it, that's really hard to have that much extra labor and extra people at one time we also have a lot i'm so close to the downtown kansas city area we're like 25 minutes now we just say 20. but my point out ivy didn't pay for this. true Hy very true there's a coupon in it and these companies that want to sell items would advertise in the back page. Right, in the front and back. And yeah, they had, they actually had their vendors that actually paid for the book. Paid yeah. for these, these yeah. dollars off coupons. Yeah, so they, yeah, so technically, they, I'm sorry. yes. So, so did you charge the school, or excuse me, not the school, the store to? No, okay, so Hy-Vee would print these. And they would, they, get, they, they had the right to use them. them. Yes, they would pass them out in their stores and then would give me back the amount that I needed for my school tours. And at the same time, it gave me the opportunity to put coupons on their service desks. That was kind of a trade off there. They would give me the opportunity to market my coupons for my business. They didn't sell my tickets. That's a whole nother ball of wax, but just pass out the coupons. You know, it would be like go to one before all the digital coupons came out. That was really where the, this was one of our stepping stones was what I could do that. So yes, in all that, but it required me having an employee going around to 30 stores in Kansas City, restocking coupons every week. <laughs> so that was a lot of labor and a lot of, of, lot of issues is what that was. So yes, we did, we did this for a long time. Um, again, what I said about school tours is we're about 25 minutes from downtown Kansas City. There's gotten to be, Kansas City School District's been in some, a lot of issues in the last 10, 15 years. But there's a lot of also um, oh, foundations and a lot of charitable places that provide almost a free school tour for school groups. Or they, or they give them a, a scholarship to come. So trying to compete as a private business, as, as somebody that's, that needs to make money on the farm to pay my payroll, as opposed to a scholarship from a big, you know, the symphony or somebody else that's already getting tax dollars is super hard to compete with. I found that that's, that's really not my market anymore. And especially not this past fall, we'll talk about that. But yeah. Uh, this was our start with hy -Vee. I mean, this is the first thing they did for us. And then in O. In 02, I bought a CP Huntington train out of Texas, sight unseen. And uh, I spent the next couple of months when it was wet and I couldn't plant corn or soybeans laying track. And it was a big job, 100 foot was a huge day. Anyway, we went to hy -Vee and we uh, said, uh, what can you do for us? And they actually took a picture of this train and put it on the front of these sacks. Excuse me? I, I don't have any more of them left. I'm anyway, sure. they actually provided us with how many thousand? And then they also, every hy store in the whole Kansas City Metro got 40,000 sacks to sack groceries in with our logo on it. I mean, you can't buy advertising like that. 
But then, you know, the whole thing about getting away from the plastic sacks for about the last six years, all they've done is they would provide me, they wouldn't print them specially again because they're trying to get away from them. They would just give me the stacks that they're normally using in the store, which that worked for me too at that point is what we did. To go along with the school tours, again, um, we added the activity of the gemstone mining, which some of you may have seen. I don't know if you haven't. Um, it's very, it's a, like a mining sluice and you get a bag of mining rough that's a sand with the gemstones in it and you dump it in and you have a sieve and you shake it back and forth in the water and you come out with the gemstones. Well, we made it into one of our school tour activities, which worked great for several years. As far as we did, uh, this is the, the ID card that they get on the right hand side they've stuck their stones on it where they belong and here's the lines of kids we added some other activities such as having a uh, like a magnifying glass and things like that that they could do it well and we have a a whole uh curriculum we had a big uh speech that we did while we were doing it did that kind of thing so this worked really well and tied in very well i still have a few requests for this on and not in 2020, but up until 19, we would have like, it wouldn't let them pick that every day because that's a very labor intensive tour that takes more people explaining. It takes smaller school groups. But it, like I said, I think it just depends on your, on where you're going with it. Um, but that worked very well. And what we did in up until 2020, we would have like two uh, gemstone mining days. And I would let them sign up for school tours on just those certain days so I knew which ones we were going to have. Because I, we also have a, you can't, I don't really have the picture of them. We also have these big boxes that have a lot of, uh, of examples, a lot of samples of all the different rocks. I have the metamorphic and the, and the igneous and the sedimentary. And I, I mean, we have a pretty good collection. Everybody brings me rocks. They would for a long time brought me rocks from everywhere. And then I'd go to the gemstone show and I'd buy some and whatever, but they had some, I, we had a nice display, but time you set the display up and you do the talk and you go and you sieve and then you come back. It's a lot different than doing the pumpkin tour where we, we would talk to them in the one barn and give them the whole history of, of the pumpkins and the different kinds of pumpkins we grow and squash and gourds. And then we would take them through the animals and through a couple of other activities and they'd end up at the wagon ride, take their wagon ride to the field, get their pie pumpkin, bring it back. Then they had time to do the rest of their tour. That was not as labor intensive as this one was. So that's kind of my history of my school tours. But again, I think things have really changed. 2020, it was like school tour. I probably had 10 total classes. I had a couple of private schools and I had some preschools. But you know, as far as public schools, they were gone. I cannot see that coming back this year. And I would really be surprised if it, I mean, they can sit in their classroom and do a Zoom class now. And I might go to that if I wanted to. Again, what, I, what we do here and what I do in the pumpkin patch, it, he, all of our family farms full-time. I'm a gopher a lot of the times. It's not my full-time year round position. I'm pretty satisfied with doing six weeks of seven days a week. It won't be seven days from now on, but seven days a week and weekends and getting ready and spending the whole year adding stuff, getting things ready. Um, I, and until I have a next generation, my daughter, like I said, our daughter helps me a lot, but I don't have the next generation that come in and that's their full time job. So until that happens, we're pretty satisfied with our six weeks business and maybe a couple of other activities and events during the year, but not all the time is what we do. So, uh, and again, I, we skipped a lot of years in here. Uh, yes, we added the big, I can't go back, can I? I don't think I have it. I was gonna say, we have a big red, what I call our science barn, that's also our bakery. And uh, we added it in 98 and we did school tours out of it. We did food service out of it, very multi-purpose. In 02, when we added the train down here, the CP Huntington, of course, you can't get a train and then not have a train station. So we had to put the train station up. And then I had to make the train station pay for itself. So we've added food service in it, different years and different things. Um, some of these pictures, this was, again, I was doing close to 16,000 school groups in six weeks. It was crazy. Uh, I would have 35 school buses at one time. 
it has definitely gone down since about 2010 in the last 10 years. But, uh, you know, she says still. she says she does all this by herself and all the kids oh. did come to the farming operation. But they've kind of taken over the farming operation. So I'm now the head of disruption. <laughs> That's always been true. And then to also throw in here, uh, we have, and you saw a picture on that one aerial, uh, we have the second, well, the largest corn maze in the state of Missouri, second largest one in our uh, group, in, our, in the company. But what we did was, like my pumpkin patch, our pumpkin patch is only open from like during, it we're open seven days when we're open, but we don't do the night dark thing is what we don't do. And the corn maze, we had seen it a couple of conferences and we're like, oh, we need to add this, we need to do this. But I'm thinking, okay, it's gonna be Friday and Saturday night. Uh-uh, no, I'm ready to go home at six or seven o'clock, not 10 o'clock and midnight and any of that stuff. So when our oldest son got out of college in 04, we sent him to a maze conference and he, <laughs> he runs with everything anyway. Our, uh, but he saw the maze opportunity and then when his younger, his, sec, his brother got out of college in 05, the two of them went together and built a, and have a corn maze. They use a custom corn maze cutter. There's like four or five different companies that I know of, most of them in the United States. We're with one of them called Maze Play. Sean Stallworthy is from Idaho, comes through, uh, takes a big field of corn, like you see behind those pumpkins over there. And normally, well, it's not that, it's usually like this tall and cuts it. Well, this past year was the first year that he actually came in and planted it in the corn maze thing is what he did. They've got the they've got all their GPS and all their row shutoffs now that they can actually plant it in the design so they don't have to come back and cut it and worry about the weather dependency and, and things like that. Um, that was the first year and it it worked out pretty well. So I think they're going to stick with that. But in the meantime, they have their own separate activities, but they're only open on Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night and Sunday which is fine with me. And since then, uh, my older oldest son's wife, our daughter-in-law has taken over the staffing, the planning, um, everything that has to do with, with the maze end of it. We share the same parking lot. Uh, I always call it a sister operation. It's not my operation anymore. I actually helped him and helped them all before he got married, but, um, and it used to be mine, but it's we not anymore. Sell joint we do. We, but we do sell a AS, a combo pass to both of them because people were having trouble distinguishing and they, uh, the, the general public now wants to pay one price. They want to pay, they want to slap down, they don't even care how much it is. They want to slap down one price and pay for whatever they want to do that day. We, we used to have two or three more activities that were pay as you go. You know, it's like a dollar here or maybe $5 to do the gemstone or whatever. But if we can sell the whole combo pack or my platinum pass, so be it. Especially since the online has come in the last few years and they can put, their, put it on their credit card and make it there and they don't have to worry about anything. That's what they want to do. So we, yes, with the corn maze, we sell the combo pass. It works wonderfully. And we um, actually, <laughs> ticketing systems, yes, it's kind of funny because we use two separate ticketing systems. They And that creates a little bit of a, a glitch, it, it's it's just they have to redeem it at my place first. I give them a ticket to go to next door, but they use one that came from their maze company called uh, Farm Pass. We have gone in the last couple of years to uh, Ticket Leap and Ticket Spice is very good. Yes, Ticket Spice is another one that I would consider. It's just, I, don't, I think it had a couple of glitches in it a couple of years ago when I started Ticket Leap. So uh, <clears throat> Ticket Spice is very, very, User friendly, I think more than and again, you got to get down in the the nitty gritty. What do they charge you per ticket? What are they charging for fees? What are they, you know? Can you if you're like us, can you turn it off in your off season? Can you turn it back on when you need to? There's so many little nuances. People wonder what we do all the rest of the year. Well, I'm always looking up something and trying to figure out how it's going to work and and do that stuff because especially that stuff that to me it just it makes my head hurt trying to look it all up and figure it all up. So uh, that's what we do. But yes, the corn maze is totally separate. They have, a, they have food service, they have a bar, they have uh, activities, play yards, they have four separate mazes in it. It has 10 miles of paths. It's very nice, it's great. Uh, 
Patrick Mahomes' uh, a fiance came out with a group of uh, her friends last fall, did a private party on a Sunday night when they had canceled the Chiefs game that Sunday and wanted to know if my daughter-in-law would stay open four hours on Sunday night when they're normally closed. So she and like five of the girls who were all players, wives and girlfriends could come out and with nobody else there. And sure, my daughter-in-law was all over that. <laughs> and so- As long as we get some PR out of it. Uh, well, yeah, yes. I mean, it's, you get a picture later, but yeah, so it, it was nice. So, you know, there's always opportunities uh, to do different things. One year um, back when, before they got married, and I was kind of helping with the corn maze, the uh, Lion King's staff was in, the Lion King was in Kansas City, and they called me and they wanted to do something with their family, bring their kids along with them, most of the actors and, and actresses, and they wanted to do something with their kids, and they wanted to go to the corn maze during the week, like during the day, and I go, hmm, okay, whatever, and they gave us tickets to go to the Lion King, and we got to go behind stage, it was really cool, so I enjoyed that part. But um, yeah, the pumpkin patch, we added the, the train in 02, uh, pig races, we added before that. Uh, again, if you've seen them at state fairs around here, some places it's funny when you, if you go to the Northeast or some other states, they never heard of pig races. Like we've had them at the state fair, we've had all stuff like that. So we have an actor that comes out and he's, he does a great job and we do it, um, you know, we have three heats of pigs that go around and they do that. Uh, we also have uh, like in the middle, we didn't do it this fall because of COVID, but we've had a pumpkin princess. I know other people have done other characters that mean anything you can do when you like when you normally go to a festival or do something that works out really well. Uh, in the middle, that was our first weekend food service outside. We call that Kate's Kitchen. Um, again, with my planning and zoning, along with my health department, uh, I have a lot of trouble putting permanent buildings up. I'm in a floodplain. So uh, we do a lot of them on runners. As big as I can make a building on runners, it goes on runners. Then he can hook up to it in his tractor and move it wherever it wants to be and later on. And so that building is actually where I sell my mining rough out of at the mining building now. Um, this past fall, we just built a new donut building. I'll give you a little bit about that in a second. That donut building became the kettle corn building. The kettle corn building became my mama's nursing barn. I mean, we moved these little sheds and what was originally a little tiny mining shack that was about a six by six became my animal feed barn. We, we, we moved buildings everywhere last fall. But um, again, our planning and zoning is really, really strict. So, <clears throat> yes, this is something we started way 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 back i mean in that original red barn i was talking about we had what they called a belshaw mark ii donut maker and it made regular sized donuts it's not the little orbits that you do see at some of the state fairs and some of the places but it was it was a great i didn't know anything about it it they were ugly donuts and they weren't they i didn't think they were the best tasting but we got to be known for pumpkin donuts and i think I've heard that more than once. You need to pick a signature item or something that you're pretty well known for. Whether you're known for Christmas trees or flowers or pumpkins or pumpkin donuts or whatever. So we're known for really pumpkin donuts and cider slushes is what we're known for in the fall, even though I don't do apple trees or anything to do with apples. So uh, the donut thing has just been crazy. We have gone from that little bitty, well, it was a tabletop, which my Mark Fives are the next size up tabletops. And then they went in their own building. And then we went to two Mark Fives, could not keep up. I mean, I had people start making donuts on a Saturday at like three or four o'clock in the morning. By three o'clock in the afternoon, we were sold out and they were waiting on them. And I wouldn't wait 45 minutes for a dozen donuts anywhere but they would sit around and wait on them. And so this past well, year- They would stand in line. Yeah, that's what I mean. They would stand in and line. And these lines would be 300 foot long. It was crazy. <laughs> and so um, this past year, last fall, for a year ago, we decided we needed a bigger building and a bigger uh, donut machine, bigger automated and everything. So we bought a uh, Mark VI reconditioned one from Michigan another part that what i call a, a melter where it melts the grease because that's an essential part of donuts is a lot of grease and we would um and built a whole new building the hood system and the whole nine yards 
makes a line of four donuts going across with that one Mark VI, I can make more than my two Mark Vs the same amount of time. It was amazing. It was so much nicer. So we're known for pumpkin donuts. In 19, in one day, we made over 10,000 donuts in one day. And we sell a few singles. I don't know why, I haven't got the nerve to actually cut out totally singles, but we sell mostly, mostly dozens. Some of them are half, we do half dozens, we do dozens in those plastic clamshells you see right down there. Last April, we had donut mix left over. So during this COVID thing, when everybody was shut down, people were uh, stare crazy from staying home, right? She put on our Facebook page that she was gonna make donuts take orders for dozens of donuts. You put your order in and she did them on Tuesdays and Thursdays the first week and she sold 500 dozen a day. All right, the next week we were out of donut mix. So we went to the local distributor and found out they had some apple crisp donut mix. So we, she bought that and next week she did apple crisp donuts and 500 a day. And then that was kind of the end of that. We, Kind of got tired of it, I think. <laughs> well, it was also uh, the fact that, like I said, our daughter, that's a veterinarian, had Tuesdays and Thursdays off. So we made them on, and my manager and her kids and everybody. So we would start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 2 o'clock, we'd have the 500 dozen made. Then we'd start having pickup by, like, 3 o'clock. And I also had a chance to, like, I had leftover jams and jellies that we sell in our store. I had leftover bottles of private label wine that we have, and I basically sold my leftover stock that I usually keep till the next season. It was great. I mean, I sold out of, the wine went first, of course, but the people would come out, it was the first time in April that I think some of the grandparents and the kids had been locked down, you know, out of school, and that they would come with a whole car load. It would be mom, dad, kids, grandma, grandpa, dog, uh, everything and then they'd go can we just park in the parking lot and eat our donuts and I go yeah sure whatever you know so they would they'd come by drive through and get their stuff and they well we brought a thermos of coffee for grandma and grandpa and they'd sit over there and eat their donuts so that were and I also got a nice down payment on my donut machine that way <laughs> I had to make a little bit to get my new donut machine but I didn't have it that was last April we got our new donut machine in the fall so and that's our uh, our only grandson that our daughter's little boy that he loves donuts he's he's a donut guru but um yeah we've been known for a lot of of donuts and what they and we're looking at some other things to do this fall like we may do a donuts a la mode i mean anything i can do with them um now that i know that i can actually make them and make them a little bit faster and kind of keep up we we may do some other things and one thing i've learned listen to your customers I, they kept telling me, they go, well, you realize we come back and buy like four extra dozen because I stick them in the freezer and they're good at Christmas. And I go, huh? And they go, yeah, 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 we freeze them all. And then I pull them out and I stick them one in the microwave for 10 seconds. I actually had a sticker made this past fall and put the sticker on that told how to reheat them because that, they, they told me. So listen to your customers on, on what they, because, you know, they're the ones, I don't have time to sit up at night and think of all this stuff. They, they do. Um, and in the meantime, we've added a whole lot of activities that we redid our animal barn in the top right. We put, uh, made it, uh, added a little bit onto the end, redid the whole thing and new pins in it. So that's the inside of our animal barn now. Uh, we have the traditional farm animals, uh, you know, donkey, sheep, goats, lots and lots of goats. I'm renting more goats it every look year now. Anymore. It's got a few more fly specks on the ceiling. <laughs> I have Bunnyville. We have Bunnyville. We have uh, several, a couple of pins that have, uh, you know, birds, peacocks, chickens, uh, guineas, things like that. Our, our first inflatable, which we, we had trouble thinking about this, was uh, the jumping pumpkin. We thought it would be the safest. And it's still, it's still good. But what we found out was the jumping pillows were good, too. So we now have two jumping pillows because we needed to separate out age and size. So in order to, you know, get one for everybody, you don't want, because that's, I this, hate, this I is hate, best for small children. They, that is the best for small children and the parents can actually jump on there it's, it's together. In, it's in sections. And in compartments. Jump pillow, you have an older kid get on there and jump it and throw somebody off. That's why you have to keep the sizes and ages separated. So you have to separate them out because you don't want um, one of my 
pet peeve terms in agritourism is collateral damage. And nobody wants collateral damage. That basically means somebody got hurt. So <laughs> that means that's a no-no for me, for us. We try to do whatever. Um, we belong to several organizations. That's how we met uh, Whitney and, and Michaela and everybody was, uh, we belong to NAFMA, North American Farm Direct Marketing Association. I know there's several Facebook groups. There's an agritourism group there that's really good, great ideas. There's several on growing flowers and cut flowers. And there's so much more information. When we started doing this, there were, hardly was the internet. <laughs> so, I mean, learning from others was driving, hearing about something and driving there and going and seeing it or talking to somebody at a conference. We weren't able to sit at home and look stuff up. So what now you can look stuff up. What you're trying to say is we're old. Yes, we are. We are very old. And so now, you know, and you can look online and compare things and do different things. So um, we've added, we added the corn pit, which is very, very, very popular. Um, a lot of people do them different ways. I, we saw one last summer in Michigan that had this humongous barn built over, uh, somebody referred to it as the Taj Mahal of, of uh, corn pits. But uh, the corn, and we put a tent up, we finally put concrete on the, we put a concrete pad down. Put the hay bales under it, have the tent set up, and then he augers corn in it and they just play in it. That is one of the most popular. Well, one of the very first ones we had was actually the little round grain bin and had loose corn in it. That was very popular, needed more room. So this one, it's just a pain to get the corn out. So, but again, uh, in 2020, we did not have it because of COVID. Who knew what was going on? And I also felt like I was just kind of doing my due diligence if I didn't let people get in there and waller around in corn and then the next kid get in there and rub around on it and so we uh, we didn't do it uh, but it's super popular i mean that is one of the most popular things that we that we've ever done um we also before 2016 uh, when you talk about i don't really i don't think i have it divided up into food service but um uh, i want to see where i am kind of the donuts, but I'm going to say, no. So anyway, go back to a little bit on food service. Start out slow, but when I kind of took it over, um, at a, I kind of do the basic stuff as far as hamburgers, hot dogs. We, we're trying to expand a little bit, but yet sometimes you feel like you get too many things and too much stuff going on. And it's coming, you have to kind of draw back and go to the basics. One of the first things I ever got the best, um, you know, we doing cans of pop, bottles pop, whatever at that point, was getting... Um, collectible cups, you can go to collectible cups, you go anywhere. And these have been my three standbys for a lot of years. You can come up and look at them later, whatever. I have a 16 ounce, 32 ounce, and a 48 ounce. And um, they can, we can put water pop, lemonade tea, uh, cider slush. Cider slush is an upcharge. Anything that has cider slush is upcharge because it's, it's higher. But I mean, when you go consider how many pennies worth of pop or tea, you put in a cup like this and you can sell it for a couple extra more dollars, that's money in your pocket. And uh, this poor thing, he was so perfect and everything and they quit making the mold. So I only have a very few left. I made it through this season, but I don't have any more and I can't get it. I'm gonna have to go to something else. They make the little bitty pumpkin ones, but I love this thing because you only put this much drink in the bottom and the rest of it's just pretty. The kids have gotta have it. The kids, every kid has to have one. You know, I, I have refill prices on them too and you'd think that this would be the family cup. Oh, no, no, no. Every kid had to have one of these, then mom and dad might have one of those. But the, those were my cup prices. And then, um, I'm trying to think, what year did we start this? Anyway, one of the things when you talk about, I know you talked about selling all the personalized stuff and everything that has your logo on it and everything. We went into, the first inkling of it was getting into uh, liquor and into wine. We have all of our liquor licenses from the state and from the county and things like that. But we started out with just wine tasting. Uh, a local, um, they're local, Missouri, <laughs> uh, wine company does a lot of private labeling for all the wineries in Missouri, a lot. And so I went to them and found out what it took to get my label approved, and what I needed to do, went through all that process, so we have four different wines that we have uh, labeled and their pictures and we made them real farmy, real historic, like it's um, Aunt Kate's Rosé, it's uh, Aunt Lillian's uh, White Lace, it's Uncle Carl's um, 
what is it? Uh, anyway, Uncle Bud's Railroad Red. Anyway, we tried to make them since it's country cousins. Oh, Carl's Ruby Red. Ruby Red. That's was uh, Carl's. And so we try to make them kind of like the, um, make it the family theme, just what we were trying to do. So we would give them a, a wine, and then I got private labeled glasses, and they would get a wine tasting in the glass for one price and do all that. Well, then. These uh, are the popular ones. No, not yet. No, <laughs> not yet. Wine slush. Yes. So we went to this like two or three years ago. And they make the bags of the wine slush. If you go to any wineries nowadays, you get a wine slush. Well, it's about 90% sugar, is what it is. No. And uh, so I had a couple, I uh, had an old slush machine that I originally started with my cider slushes, and I've repurposed it to this. I'm going to get a bigger one now. But uh, yes, the wine slushes that we can put, and these are just the plastic, little plastic glasses that they can take that in. They can also get a glass of wine in that too. But this year we didn't do the wine tasting. They literally would have to buy, we did the, um, the wine slushes, we did just a glass of wine. I've gone to also include craft beer, regular beer and craft beer, Lo I mean domestic beer and craft beer. They really wanted craft beer, that's why I had to add it. I, that's who gone can, crazy. Who can drink that pumpkin stuff? <laughs> <laughs> they drink a lot of that pumpkin stuff, that pumpkin beer. They drink a lot of it in the fall. But yeah, I mean, if mom comes in and wants her wine slush, dad wants a beer. So that, and then I started out with a wine patio. We thought, oh, okay, they can just go out of the building and sit out there. No, that's not the culture. You really, like I said, things have changed so much. You have to think of what the culture is now. I mean, if a family, and our kids are the same way with kids, if they go to a local brewery, they're not leaving the kids at home. They're going there that in the afternoon. They'll sit outside on the patio. You know, they'll order something to eat and have their beer, and the kids are there too. Well, it's the same way at the pumpkin patch. So we let them we let them wander all over and my beer sales and my wine sales have gone through the roof with the since they're not able to like they don't have to sit inside the little bitty fence they can wander around and that really isn't anything different on any of our licensing than anything else it's still on my property it's still there they don't carry it out the gate or anything like that um the only thing i ran into last fall was the ladies go well, if I buy two glasses of wine, that's about the same price as your bottle. Can you just open a bottle for me? And I go, good grief. So I ended up charging a corkage fee to uncork a bottle of wine, and they would, the women would finish the wine, no, everybody would finish the wine before they got out done with the wagon ride. So, um, you know, that is a, you talk about profit margin. These are the bags that we give them to take, uh, that they do buy, they buy unopened bottles they to take home a lot they do and so this is like my little collectible bag i know that if it's in the bag they paid for it over in the depot or they can buy them in in my country store um through the years our food service we have a lot of the other things that like people have kettle corn uh the roasted nuts the that, fudge that, that's the one item that you hadn't mentioned that's a big ticket item is the kettle corn yes your your, your number one cost on kettle corn is labor i mean what you're putting into it isn't that much. And the smell, you, you screen it in, the smell just attracts people. It's just like the donuts. Yes, yes. We were, uh, we kind of had it confined at, one, at uh, several years ago. I had it, I had first started out with the first kettle. They stirred all day long. Well, I went through teenagers like crazy because they would not stand there and stir all day and they were worn out and then bagging it and trying to make it. Well, we did get the more automatic popper that we can make the kettle corn with. And now we make it all week long, like almost every single day and get ready for the weekend to sell enough kettle corn. And um, trying to keep up with the kettle corn is a whole nother subject. And yes, I mean, you, all you've got to have is the, the popper, the corn, the sugar, a little bit of salt and a bag. And that's all you got to have. And, and for what you can charge, huh? And, labor. and the labor, yes. <laughs> Yes, and that, and that again is what I'm looking at in a lot of these different locations and a lot of different things, uh, activities that we're adding on. I said, I just looked it up for you guys here in Oklahoma. Your minimum wage is seven and a quarter. Ours just went from 9.45 to 10.30 and we're not anything like, the, uh, like my friends are in Oregon or in West Virginia or anything like that. But if I'm looking at a dollar increase an hour for wages, for this fall, I'm looking at anything that I can cut out a person or cut back on hours or something. If I can cut, uh, have an activity that doesn't have to have a person standing there manning it all day long. 
it's really, really something we have to consider because labor is by far your biggest expense. So you have to think about, hey, can I run that and not have somebody out there manning it? And like the jumping pillows, I have to have somebody making sure they're the right height and making, you know, keeping the peace out there and stuff like that. Besides my wagon drivers and besides everybody, you really, really have to figure out what you can do. Um, our, and, and your efficiency, like our, our uh, the, the nuts that we have that are like the sugar-coated, um, pecans and cashews and walnuts and everything well now they're making them where they're already made and then all i have to do is put them in the cone and i'm looking at my efficiency of making the batches is it really cost effective for me to make that batch and pay that person or am i better buying the bulk and then just repackaging it yeah I, I'm, I'm making a lot of decisions this year for one thing so uh one of the big ticket items this is this said takes a little bit of investment but once it's there you make your money back really quickly is fudge um, we call it homemade fudge because we make it on the farm, but uh, this is a fudge program. There's another one that's come out now that, that's a little bit different, but this is a fudge program called Calico Fudge, and I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying that's what we started with, and you get those steam jacketed kettles. They sell them. You can buy them used. You can find them on eBay or some, another company is going out, candy company or something that's going out, and it's super easy to make. They provide everything from the, from the mix to the, um, they, you also can buy all the flavorings. You can buy um, you can buy your nuts from them. I buy them from my food supplier because they're cheaper. You can buy the boxes from them. But By I mean- way, This was new in 2020. We didn't used to wrap everyone individually. <laughs> yeah. Because of COVID. Now we have to wrap everyone individually. Well, I mean, we have it set up. You've seen it in Bass Pro or Cabela's or something that they have the whole fudge display and you cut them up and you pick four and maybe you get a couple free. And so we have boxes where they, they can pick their four kinds and put it in it in order to sell it more in my store and someplace where I have a lot of dust and a lot of dirt. I usually put them in a plastic container like this and have them up there just for another quick pickup item is what we do at the checkouts. At the checkouts yes, at the, in the in the store. Uh, this is another way, though. We did wrap all the individual fudge this year. I love this. My fudge lady wasn't real happy, but, you know, it's just the mix and the butter and the water, and you cook it, and you make the other ingredients like the pumpkin with it or the, or the peanut butter or the nuts or whatever you want to do, make the slabs to make the different ones. But fudge is a great item. I mean, it's just a great, it's, it, it's a great profit margin. It really is. Um, and then I'm going to say, as far as activities that we've added in the last, or even things that we've done here in the last few years, um, we took a truck that I bought at an auction and made a slide out of it. I had my welder add the things at the back and we put the big slide coming out of it. They walk up the one side, slide down the other. I have a friend that had it slid into a corn. When you, into when a, you order your poly, it, don't tell them what you're using it for because they've had some lawsuits over people you getting just, hurt. It's not a slide material. It's the same stuff, but it's just where what they're doing with it and how they're how they can actually sell it. So we made that for a truck slide. Um, in twenty, we the carousel. We've had the train for since o two. The Worlds of Fun, which is our local amusement park in Kansas City, uh, is very close. It's like six miles from me. And I used to supply them all their pumpkins and all their fall decorations. Well, they were getting rid of this carousel and they were gonna put this big fancy uh, ride in. And he goes, don't you, don't you need that carousel? And I go, no, I don't want a carousel. What the heck am I gonna do with that? And I came home and then we talked to him a little bit and we're like, okay, I guess we're gonna get a carousel. So the, our farm guys all went up and, and in one day took it all apart, well, six hours, took it all apart, put it all in a trailer. Then my next problem is I have to have a building to put it in, just kind of like the train did. So you see all the lights on this carousel? <laughs> There's 1,328 light bulbs. They were 11 watt light bulbs. We took them all out. We ordered some different LED ones from different companies and picked out the one we liked. And we replaced all those with 0.55 watt LEDs. So we dropped from 11 watt to just a little over half a watt. And it's brighter than it was before. So that's our building right next to it with the with the garage doors on it. It's got four roll-up doors on three sides. 
So if it's even, you roll up all the doors during the day or any time, and you can see those lights clear to the front of the farm when they pull in, they can see the lights of the carousel. It's really cool, especially if it starts to get a little bit darker or if it's cloudy or something. Uh, we also in 19 added on the side over here, these bathrooms, permanent bathrooms. I had never had permanent bathrooms. I'd always used porta potties. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, that you talk about a regulatory nightmare. Yes, our uh, our local health department sent me to DNR at the state. They had to divide again the Taj Mahal of bathrooms and what we had to put out there for a septic system and everything. We're on the farm. I have rural water. I have septic system. I have single phase power. Um, <laughs> we ended up spending three times what we should. Have. Yeah, and for bathrooms that are going to be open six weeks, they're not open year round. So anyway, they're beautiful bathrooms, though. <laughs> they're gorgeous. <laughs> they're gorgeous. But um, yes, they're very nice. And then we, I had my welder, the same guy that helped me on the truck, built me the pumpkin cannon down here, the pumpkinator. And we do a pumpkin show on the weekends and have it out there. It'll shoot that pumpkin, depending That's on your air pressure. That's a anhydrous nurse tank that we put a truck hoist under it. And we can tilt it at the angle we want. And I, I've got a commercial air compressor I fill it up with. It doesn't take, what, two minutes to fill it? Mm -hmm. You don't want to run it over about 30, 35 pounds of pressure. You go any higher than that. Well, we're a mile from the river. First time I ran up to 60 pounds and put the uh, pumpkin in the river. <laughs> yeah, you want them to be able to see the pumpkin when it goes down, not be able to just go, <laughs> okay, there it went. So uh, we've added that. We also uh, put the last, in 2019, again, I had a little bitty table to do wine slushes, wine tasting, sell, beer sales out of, so we added another whole bar on the one whole side, be able to divide the wine tasting from the, from the other sales. It worked great. Um, yes, parents love the craft beer. They just absolutely love it. Like I said, that was one of the, my requested things. Um, 2020, huh, yeah. That was uh, something else. We went to curbside pickup for, they, I'd let them order what they wanted. I had, a, a, again, on our website, we had, a, and we use Square for all of our checkouts everywhere. I have like 22 Square stations. So we had, uh, we were able to do curbside pickup. We did um, a, only a certain amount of things, like you know, jams and jellies were easy to do. They could order, not, not my perishable, they couldn't order drinks, but they could order donuts on a daily basis and they could and pick them up. I had one lady in charge of that, friend of mine, teacher that had just retired. I knew she could handle it and be meticulous enough that everything was done right, did that. Um, we had some other ticketing things that we changed because we've been a, um, I've been where you can buy them online, you can buy them at the door. Well, this year I, we tried the time ticketing uh, to try to spread everybody out. It worked wonderfully, I'll never go back. And then the other part was uh, I had had a group season pass, which came way back in the days where it was grandma and grandpa and the parents and the grandkids. And I wanted a group to make sure everybody could get in. Well, I wanted to go to individual season, but people were abusing that. People were selling them on Craigslist. They didn't have pictures on them. They were selling them. They were passing them around. You know, this kid could come this weekend. He was my son this weekend, not my son next weekend, whatever. So this year we went to, and I found a another... Uh, I just went blank. Uh, What's the name of it? Yeah, oh, it's an, it's another ticketing system for my, I'll think of it in a second. But anyway, it, it integrates with Ticket Leap. And I can do my individual season passes. They can download their photo. It just gets you to be, it, it made us in the same thing as the Worlds of Fun or whatever. And that way they had a picture ID. It was in my computer. It was on their, it was on their card. And everything was on their phone. It was great. And I had no backlash because it was a, because it was COVID. I had no backlash whatsoever. It was awesome. Uh, our sanitation crews did like everybody else, you know, lots of distancing and paying. Uh, the minimal school tours, again, did we miss them? Uh, we're all kind of going, no, no, because again, when they come, they're like, oh, you didn't spend enough time with me, and oh, I missed this, no, no, and oh, I missed, didn't do this. And We missed the kids. I miss the kids. I, mean, I do miss that education part, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to put more signage in the animal barn or in different locations where basically when the families come out, they can read it, they can go through that, which the teachers used to do that, but if, the, if they can come out with their families, um, I try to do that is what happens. 
uh, this year was local, local, local. People wanted local everything. And when they cleaned out my store, and we have a pretty good store with a lot of, of gift items and a lot of different things. They, I mean, it was looking bare after like the first two weeks and I had four more weekends. I was like, what am I gonna do? I couldn't reorder my jams and jellies. The turnaround time on those were horrendous. I couldn't order um, two or three other things. It was just, oh, we're back, you know, back ordered. And so I went, I went to South Missouri and picked up a whole load of jams and jellies uh, from families down there that I found that oh, would do it. Mennonite Kitchen. The Mennonite Kitchen down there that I'd never dealt with before. They were super great and they go, yeah, we got everything, come on down. So I drove down there. I found our local honey guy. I couldn't, used to couldn't sell honey. I sold the heck out of honey this year. I have another friend that's doing uh, popcorn and she's doing a great job. And that's uh, like a family name. We did the popcorn. Um, yeah, there's lots of things that we were able to implement this year that were good. Um, you know, in the same way with, um, you know, I, we, again, if you're doing this every day, as opposed to like we have been doing, uh, we've had a lot of discussion and a lot of soul searching. And as far as the being closed one day a week, like we're open all seven days. We've been open seven days a week forever, ever since we started probably gonna be closed. Our big day that we could be closed would be a Tuesday. Monday's a holiday, a couple or three days, and a lot of people Monday. Um, there were a lot of other, I can't see a lot of these jobs that people are gonna go back to their office cubicles every single day. And so therefore our increase in business during the week, like even at, I could tell when mom and dad would get off their computer job at like three or four o'clock in the afternoon and the kids were done with school, they would come out then. The a lot more than normal. The kids were in school. <laughs> Most of a lot, the elementary kids are in our area. The elementary kids are in school. The high school ones aren't too much, a couple days a week. But I could just tell that they were, they were like, oh, we don't want the weekend crowd. I'm going to come during the week. And I could tell that. So we may, for our sanity and for the able to uh, get some actual work done, you guys know that you, when you're open, you're managing not just the public, but your people and everybody else too. So if you have that day that you can sit and think and order and you know, finish what you need to do to get ready for the next week. Um, we may, we're probably going to be closed one day this coming fall, and I may shorten my hours again, a, a, an hour in the, in the night too. So just like we were, they were talking earlier. Um, that six to seven o'clock hour is is iffy. It gets dark. It gets cold. Uh, my guys are tired at that point, well, and once again, we're getting old. And we're getting old. But no, I'm. I mean, I'm seeing that trend. <laughs> I don't know how many years it'll take, but you know, the cities are closed at five or six o'clock or whatever. It's, it's a lot different than it used to be. It is at home anyway. So we're doing that. Um, to give you uh, some of the other things I've got up here, you're welcome to, the fudge is old from last fall. You're, I wouldn't really eat it, but you're welcome to whatever else. Sugar. Um, these, oh, these are our um, train tickets that we use for the train. We punch them when they go on the train, but actually we're collecting them now because um, you know how I said people want to pay one price? That's what we've gone to. We've gone to a platinum pass and they get a train ticket. They get, a, they get one carousel ride while they're there. They get a carousel token. Uh, they get uh, a bag of mining rough. So we give them things to use at each one. They get a wristband, but we give things to use at each one. These are my tickets that if I have any comp tickets or if I have anything that we need to give ahead of time, I donate a lot to fundraisers and to, to uh, different things people are gonna have in town. I donate uh, those, those are my tickets. Um, our, you can see, this is, this is our employee shirt. We used to have the dark green, um, 100 green ones. Well, I wanted something different finally. And then also, um, I can see my employees at a distance in one of these. I can see that teenager way over there, that's, and I don't know why high, he's over there. That's hiding behind a bale straw. Yeah, well, I can see him. We can all see him a lot better. So we've gone to these orange ones. And I've also, it was a huge expense to pay for the embroidered shirts and the collared polo shirts we were using. They were a big expense. I asked for them back, and they were either in bad shape or whatever. This is kind of different, but it's worked very well. I've had very, I actually charge them when they come to work, I charge them $10 for the shirt. And then when they turn it at the end of the year, that goes back on their paycheck. It comes out of their paycheck, the $10 does, then they get it back at the end of the year if they turn it in. If they want to keep the shirt, fine. I get my 10 bucks. Same way with the sweatshirt. 
I charge $20 for the sweatshirt. And then if they want to keep it, it's $20. If they want to turn it back in, and I, I don't complain if it's absolutely filthy, dirty, stained, because they work, I, I'm, that's fine. But if they want to turn it back in, I'll give them their $20 back. But it just kept me from the people that show up one day, two days, three days, one weekend, and are gone. Then I'm losing a shirt. And it, that gets to be pricey after a while. These are some shirts that we sell in the store. Um, I have one that has kind of a red truck on it, has some writing on the back. We actually had a contest, and this was from a customer. Uh, I'm just here for the goats and donuts, because that's kind of what it was. And uh, I need another one this year. I'm really, that's probably what I'm going to work on pretty soon. I need another shirt. But yeah, the shirt sales go pretty good. Sweatshirts sell better than anything because they all come out and it's got cold and they didn't bring a sweatshirt. So I sell lots of sweatshirts more than anything. Jams and jellies. Um, did you say you used, um, you have to, I started out with House of Webster. Yes, I did. Um, and they were good. It was just, there were some things I couldn't get from them. And some things, and Shawnee Canning kind of courted me a little bit. So I use Shawnee Canning. There's a lot of different jams and jelly companies you can do. And again, the private label, you know, you can design it. You can do, what, you can do whatever you want to with it. So, um, yeah, anything jams and jellies this fall, that other stuff that I got that had their label on, they didn't care. They wanted it too. So they would just buy whatever was on the shelf and they... And they wanted anything. I don't think, oh, here, I know. This is what we, this is kind of what we, I've been talking about the whole time. Listen and respond to what your customers tell you. Research if you're gonna, if you're gonna put a new donut machine in or if you wanna do why, if you want whatever you wanna do, do your research. Uh, we've become members of a variety. I'm actually a member of the North Carolina uh, Agritourism Association, the Kansas one, uh, might be Oklahoma, I'm not sure. And so different people out of, out of the ordinary. Missouri's a little lacking on agritourism, I will, to be real honest. And I told them so, so I'm not telling out of school. Um, and then try to be thematic. Like we've done Uncle Bud's Railroad, we do Aunt Kate's. We just try to be thematic. Little Bud's Railroad, the pig races, events. Um, car show was beautiful, but they don't want to drive down a gravel road to come to my place. Uh, they want a blacktop. Uh, music, Pumpkin Princess, the Country Carousel is what we named the, the big carousel. So we've done all that kind of stuff. Uh, we think outside the boxes. We do comic cards, emails. I totally agree with the email list. And you can do all the social media you want, but man, if you get that email list, it's yours. You know, it's yours. You try to get your own email list and send out your email blast. Uh, visit other sites. That's so easy to do nowadays. We belong to Chamber of Commerce, Kansas City Attraction Association, NAFMA, uh, a bunch of different ones. We start small and build slowly. That's this didn't my, happen in that's two my, years. That's my recommendation. Treat yes. it like you do a farm. Yes. You grow slow. Don't try to do everything at once. Yeah. Add, something, add a few things every year. I've been to some auctions where they've there. sold out in a year or two. So, yes, yeah, start out slowly. Just add something every year. Uh, and you have to upkeep the old. You know, I'll go out there and I was like, ooh, that fence looks awful. That's something we really, instead of adding something new, I really need to work on that. Um, can't be everything to everybody. You'll hear somebody gripe and moan about something and you go, Ugh. you know, you kind of have to breathe and think about it tomorrow. The wants to see, they want to come to the farm and be part of the farm, but they want the farm ooh, to be free. Did I push it? I pushed it one too many times, sorry. But yeah, that's what we did. Questions? Okay, on our very busiest Saturday, we probably have 60 to 65 at one time. Uh, during the entire season, a lot of people are all part-time. They're weekday, weekend, Tuesday, Thursday. Oh, I've worked for you for 15 years and I have one day off. So, uh, and I love them to come back <laughs> the one or two days they can. Uh, I probably will hire a total of about 120 to 130 during in the course of an entire season. But on a very busiest given day, we're probably about 60 to 65. And how, how long have y'all been doing this? 31 years. We started in 1991. Yes. Yes. Do you guys have to carry workers' comp insurance? Workman's comp? Do you have to carry workers' comp insurance? Yes, I do. Yes, I, yes, I do. I carry workman's comp on, on everybody there and everybody on the farm side. Yes, I do. Yes. And I will I will reiterate what they said up here today too and I've said it on the on the on the app. Um, 
an insurance broker. Go to an insurance broker, look them up. They make them do the legwork. That's their job. They will look up all the different companies, which you can't, I've been with about three different companies. Mine now is West Bend, they've been great. But you know, you do have to be, tell them, yep, I'm at, and I have a separate liquor liability policy. I have a separate policy insuring that stupid train and carousel. Um, I, you know, but I tell them, yep, I've got this going, you know, I, I serve this, I do this, you know, I sell that and, and I'm adding this this year and I'm adding this this year. You got to be up front with them. But insurance is, is just like machinery or anything else. It's no better than who's selling it to you. Yeah. You got to have them stand behind you. Yes. Signage is so important. I do have a lot of signage, and some of it's even on the website too. Okay. It's kind of covering all your bases. Again, I listen a lot to what my insurance company tells me, what my state tells me, what my county tells me. It does. It does seem like sometimes I have a sign up everywhere, yeah. but um, you know. And at the same time, telling your staff what to say too. It's like no, you know, and. I do. I have new signs made every year and, and different things. It just depends what I've got going on. But no, you're, in you're totally right. I, I, you have to protect the, the public from themselves is basically what you have to do. Yes. What's your age group for your farm employees? <laughs> no, all over. But our workers are older. <laughs> well, I actually... <laughs> Yeah, I actually uh, have gone, I went down to 15 year olds about three or four years ago, which are great, but they have such limitations. They can't run machinery, you know, they can't do this. But I have a 15 year old or two that I can put on a cash register. Those little, they can, they're wonderful. They're really, really good. A lot of them are personable, they can do whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, ha I really have everybody. But uh, I, have, I probably out of those 60 that are my, I probably have 30 to 35 returnees every year. And out of those, I probably had half of them that were over 60 years old, maybe at least. I mean, my I have two 84-year-olds that were in 184 mows the grass all summer. Husband and wife. Yeah. And uh, my fudge lady, she's retired and still has two jobs. I mean, they, yeah, I just, I, they're all ages. They really are. I mean, I love to hire the, the busiest kids are too busy. The ones that are in everything, the ones that are playing football and they're in band and they're they're in music and they're doing this and they're doing that and they don't have time. I'd love to work here. You don't have time. Look at your schedule. You don't have time. I mean, I'd love to have you too, but you can't give me. I can't do one weekend, one afternoon, one one week. I mean, that's just not the. Well, we had a, we had a kid come to us a couple years ago, and he goes, "I I can't do this anymore. Uh, I'm a gamer." <laughs> Plays video games. That's what he told me. He played video games. I have had a couple of them tell me they can't work for a woman, and I said, then you just need to find another place to work. <laughs> I mean, I really did. Yeah. We, 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 had a, we had a young man who couldn't seem to keep his, we couldn't keep his britches up. <laughs> and I told him to put a belt on. I said, I, I don't want to look at your, your underneath underwear. <laughs> well, our, our daughter was still in vet school at that time. She came home one weekend. This kid walks into work. And she goes, hey, you. And she goes, pull those pants up, or I'm going to find a piece of Baylor twine and tie them up. Yeah. He went and clocked out and left. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I mean, I do have a dress code as far as they have to have, you know, I, I call them, they either have to have jeans or work pants. We have a dress code. I mean, you go to work at a business or you go to work at a, even a, a, a um, like I said, amusement park or somewhere like that, they have a dress code. There's no reason we can't either. I mean, I'm not going to deal with the, I call them pajama pants to show up to work and whatever. And I have their shirt and you're wearing my shirt. And then you have to educate them on when they can wear your shirt. Because if they go out after work and they're all somewhere they shouldn't be, no, you're not wearing my shirt. I mean, that's just the way it is. So uh, it's a lot of it's education of poor kids. So, uh, but no, my, I have a lot of really good, really good teenagers to do, do guys, that. Yes. Do you guys have equine? Uh, we just have two donkeys is all yeah. we have. Or anything like 
No, oh. I don't have pony rides. No, we have tractor rides. That's bad enough. But no, I do not have equine. Missouri has an equine law, agritourism equine law that that says they're pretty much, you know, not liable. But still, I, I'm not a horse person. I'm not a horse uh, person. It, it insurance company hears that you got horses on the farm, they freak out. Yeah, but I don't. Yes. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. But no, I, I don't. All I have is two donkeys, and they're kind of rescues, and I've had them forever. Yeah. What? One more? Any other questions, guys? And don't be afraid. I think, I think our contact stuff's on there with my email and even my phone number. Don't be afraid to ever do that. If you're ever in the Kansas City area, holler at me and stop by, please, because that's what we do. We knock on a lot of doors <laughs> when we, got, we go somewhere. We got literature and, phone, and coloring books up here in the autumn. Yeah. But anyway, just uh, thank you very much for having us. We appreciate it. I, I once had a teacher refer to him as Mr. Carolyn. I'm the director of disruption. <laughs> I'm yeah. The, I'm we the guy that when she puts. The, under Chester's, but it's, uh, he does it all, and I'm just uh, hugging kisses until, well, he, until he reels Well, when she tells me what she's going to do, I'm going I'm to add this, I'm going to add this. I'm the guy that comes and says yes or no, whether you care or not because of liability. <laughs> or finances. Well, I, I, I want a farm theme. And everything's about liability. Everything I look at is about liability. Yeah. Well, it depends how bit, how far behind they are in the fall. If they're busy combining and everything, he's not around. Yeah. So he'll help me fix things during the, get ready for during the year. Uh, but normally, when all the people are there, so I want to be four counties away. Sean. Yeah, he's, he's not. I have one full time person year round, and then it's my daughter on her days off and myself, and and we bounce ideas. And I have some other people I can bring in different times of the year if we need to do something. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really say anything. We have done an adult Easter egg hunt and we have done a breakfast with Santa. We're not doing either one of them right now. So anyway, but if you have any questions, ask me. Yeah, that, that was. Yeah. Well, let's just give them another big hand. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, like they said, Michaela and I met them on the tour bus on the Naftima tour. Um, so it's great to have them back. Um, before you guys head out and hit the road back to the other session at the farmer's market, please fill out your surveys for the sessions and the whole day. That's going to be on your Whova app on the home page under surveys. So go ahead and fill out each session you attended, please, and the overall day. And that helps us make the conference better for next year. So if you guys have any questions, Yep, talk to them. They would be happy to help, and we're so glad that you joined us today. Thank you.